I'm very happy to have you guys on here. Um, you know, it's the privacy week and, um, you know, we've um, been um, carrying out some activities before today, but, you know, today is one of those exciting days where we get to reach out to our customers and, you know, colleagues and, you know, industry enthusiasts and, you know, just everybody and to share insights on, you know, the whole concept of data privacy and, you know, the rights of, you know, the customer or the data owner. And today we have an amazing array of speakers, you know, that will be sharing insights, you know, giving us some form of direction or giving us information on our rights as the data owner. And, um, you know, so the topic of the title of this webinar, the, the, the webinar is themed, you know, your right as a data subject, the policies that govern data collection. And, you know, we have the best people to guide us, you know, you know, with this, with this theme. And, um, you know, just before I introduce our speakers, um, you know, I, I would want to say I agree, you know, with the people that have been posturing and pushing that data is the new oil, you know, data is like new currency. Um, so you have data, you have numbers, you know, you can, there's a lot you can do. So I remember the ending of last year, going into the new year, some digital services I use were giving me, you know, some analytics based on my consumption of their service, you know, from um, Netflix to um, to Spotify, then usually the banks, I know GT would also give you some insights into your spending patterns, what you spent on, and um, even Bolt, you know, give me insights into, you know, how far, you know, the number of kilometers I went to, where I went to, and just give you insights, all data driven that they could use to either you know, grow their business, you know, also help you make decisions with regards to either your lifestyle or your business too. So, so yeah, we can't underplay or underestimate the use of data, but what we are speaking about today now is what are your rights as a data subject and what should service providers do or put in place to manage or utilize your data. So to do justice to this, we have an array of amazing speakers and I'll be starting from our first speaker. Her name is Fatima Adelodun. She is, um, well, we call her, she works with the regulator, so we always harass her with everything regulatory. Um, so Fatima is a special assistant to the Director General of um, NIDA, which is the National Information Technology um, Development Agency here in Nigeria. And um, she advises the DGs on matters relating to national cybersecurity. You know, prior to her role, she used to be an information security manager at the Nigerian Bulk Electricity Trading, you know, PLC. You know, so she's played in the public sector. She, she understands, at least at the national level, you know, what, you know, how to manage not even the data of customers, but the data of citizenry, which is Nigeria as a whole. So we expect she'll be giving us a lot of insights around that. So aside um, work, she's um, a strategic cybersecurity leader. She's the founder of um, She Loves Cyber, which is, um, an, for now, it's an online organization. I'm sure, you know, they'll be doing some more things which we'll see in the future. Um, so we all know NIDA. NIDA is our um, regulator and advises on information technology in the country through regulatory standards, guidelines, and policy. So, um, so yeah, so that's Fatima for us. So we're looking forward to, you know, what you'll be sharing. The next speaker is George Ayo. George is an IT governance, risk, and compliance cybersecurity expert. Um, so he, um, he leads a team currently at InfoPrive Advisory, and, you know, they are responsible with helping, you know, clients and organizations comply to global standards, security standards. And yes, he is an expert when it comes to helping clients manage, you know, the, the data of their subjects or their customers generally. Our next speaker is Adenikere Bamiji. Um, she's a legal compliance specialist for, you know, from Velex Advisory. You know, she, um, their span of business is across the region in Africa, you know, not just Nigeria. Um, Velex is a leading gaming technology advisory and compliance firm. And, you know, they do a lot of work in Africa and I think they're going out of Africa too. Um, so currently she's legal compliance for Velex, like I had mentioned. She assists in um, she assisted in various gaming and technology brands in setting up operations in West Africa, which is Nigeria, Ghana, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Senegal, Benin Republic, and Cameroon. So um, we'll be expecting from her today to give us insights into you know when they set up these entities and you know what considerations do they put in how they manage data, you know consume and manage data. 
Um, she's um, a certified data protection officer and she's keen on data privacy, protection and security. So um, she's passionate with helping businesses implement complex data privacy solutions in Nigeria and Ghana currently. So, so we look forward to our input. Um, our next speaker is Bamedele Obende. Um, so Bamedele is quite experienced, you know, he's been in the industry for a while, over 20 years and spanning from um, infrastructure planning, software and hardware to electronic payments, to strategy concept and implementation, digital transformation, um, development and deployment of cost-effective solutions. So, you know, he's in that good position to give us insights into the technology, the digital bit, and how it's being utilized to manage customer data, and also, most importantly, help organizations, you know, comply to the best practices. So it's currently the lead executive, you know, cybersecurity software, you know me, you know, you know me is a cybersecurity compliance, security and governance automation platform. You know, they develop the platform and the company is then tasked with, you know, providing clients, you know, organizations with um, automated, you know, effective approaches in meeting, you know, their regulatory standards. So what we'll be talking about today is privacy. So he'll be giving us insight into how his company has developed solutions for providing services that help organizations comply to these standards and ensure they are continuously in compliance, you know, and also are securing customer data. So yeah, so you're welcome our speakers. And then um, I think I'll move on to the next stage, which is um, having our first speaker share insights into, you know, what we're going to be talking about today. So um, Fatima is our first speaker, and um, um, she will be talking about the regulation that governs you as a data subject. Um, so without further ado, I think we we'll just pass the mic to Fatima. So take us away. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Balabo. Thanks for the introduction. And again, thanks for this um, conversation we're having today. It's the cyber, it's the data privacy week, and so the conversations we're having today surrounding data, surrounding privacy, I think is um, really important. Um, so thanks for this initiative, but uh, most importantly, thanks for having me here. I've seen some people that I know, so I'm happy to be here with them again, and new faces. Um, I'm always happy to just meet new people, learn more, you know, um, no man is an island, nobody knows it all. So I'm happy to be here today. I think you've started very beautifully in terms of just, you know, talking about data, how some people, dis, you know, define it as the new currency, some people, dis, you know, define it as the new gold, some people define it as the new oil. Basically, data is important, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, the world has evolved or evolved to the point where there's data collection in everything. Um, we, we we had a bit of a joke at the beginning of this <laughs> at the beginning of this call when I was asked to turn on my video, and I mentioned that well, I need to. You guys need to let me know in advance if I want that you know if I want that content to be provided for me to be recorded or for my video to be used. So um, I think with everything that we do now on social media. You're posting things, you're leaving things on there, there's data collection, there's data gathering, and those the owners of those um, platforms can in turn mine your data, collect your data, transfer your data, and you as data um, um, would like to give us in this in, in this context. Sometimes I'm not even aware of some of your rights. Um, please let me know if you can hear me clearly. Sometimes I, I tend to just go on and on without confirming. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm great. Sure, so sure. basically there's data collection in almost everything that we do now, you know, thank you. Thank you for confirmation of that. Um, and it's important that not only are we aware of our rights, but also that government who, you know, um, is ultimately responsible for citizens are also, you know, they also take active steps towards protecting our data and our rights. Um, and that's what, you know, gave birth to all of this, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'll start my, I'll just start my presentation and I'll say that even the international bodies are in agreement with this conversation, with this, yeah. our notion, so much that um, protection of personal data has been assumed in the international human rights status. Um, mm -hmm. There's a paragraph 12 of it that says that the universal 
paragraph 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you yeah. know, has also provided that no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference, which is privacy, be it family, home, or correspondence, not to attacks upon his honor and reputation. And basically, everybody's rights, everybody's data should be guaranteed some level of security, right? Mm -hmm. That's how important data has become. Um, to the Nigerian perspective, we're talking about this today, um, and I think this is something that a lot of people might not be privy to, because um, the GDPR, which is the Data Protection Regulation for the EU, has an aspect of it that mandates that anybody that will be transacting with the EU data or EU citizens must have their own um, data protection regulation locally. I think that was actually what birthed the Nigerian data protection regulation because um, otherwise we're not able to transact with anybody or any citizen of EU. So that's what gave birth to um, the NDPR. Um, the objectives of the NDPR are, I think about four. And first of all, is to safeguard the rights of natural persons or citizens to data privacy. Second is to foster safe conduct for transactions, including the involving the exchange of personal data. Third is to prevent the manipulation of personal data. And lastly, is to ensure that Nigerian businesses remain competitive in international trade through the safeguards afforded by a just and equitable legal regulatory framework on data protection, which is in tune with best practice. So that's all English in the data protection <laughs> regulation. To break it down basically means that every Nigerian, every citizen of Nigeria, whether you're in Nigeria or outside of the country, you have a right, you know, for your data, whether it is like taking your data or using your data, you have a right to, you know, have those data be safeguarded. Um, you have a right to consent to giving that data or withdrawing data. Um, and your transaction of data should be secure. Like I shouldn't be transacting on Paystack, for example, putting my card there and be liable for something or be, be vulnerable to an attack. It's up to them that are collecting my data or using my data to ensure that you know, there's security involved. But it's also up to me to know that I have certain rights and I make sure that those rights are protected. Um, I have a friend who bought something online, and this is common now. You buy something, even at stores, physical stores, they ask you for, can we have your number? Can we have your name? Can we have your email addresses or, you know, date of birth? For whatever purposes, uh, you know, for their database, you have a right to either say yes or no. My friend gave her data, and um, just by doing a Google search, which we normally do from time to time, we found out that the data, um, the organization had manipulated that data. So example, Fatima, they, in. they now input my name as the store owner. I mean, I just went there to buy something, but just um, by looking up my name on Google, I found out that they had used my data, but had manipulated it by saying I was not the owner of the store and giving just reviews that would benefit them. So these are some of the things you need to be aware of. And these are some of the things that the government, by the means of the NDPR, is trying to ensure does not happen. Um, so safeguard your data, ensure that transactions are secure, and there's no manipulation of your personal data, and also that Nigerian businesses can also be competitive through the NDPR. The scope of the NDPR, you know, um, covers, first of all, um, Nigerians in Nigeria or outside of Nigeria, so citizens of Nigeria, irrespective of your, of your um, physical location, um, it also um, applies to anybody that is intending to use the data of Nigerians. So directly or indirectly, everybody, <laughs> whether you're using my data or not, or yeah. whether I'm in Nigeria or not, it affects you as well. So um, mm -hmm. it's something everybody, it, I think it's a 20 page document that, so basically it's not so, it's not so finger thumb or it's, it's not so much that you're not able to read. I would advise that anybody, um, as citizens of Nigeria, you know, take some time to just look at it so that you're aware of your rights and you're aware of, you know, just some of the things that he affords you. Um, if I will give a high level um, explanation as to some of the, you know, content in there, it covers, you know, first of all, the principles of data processing so that um, data analyzers, data collectors know 
some of the principles that should guide how they process data, how they collect data, how to ensure that consent is provided as well. Um, they are going through like a third party. They also are supposed to be aware of, you know, just guidelines, you know, to, to guide that process. It talks about um, data security, um, objections of data subjects, your right as a data owner or as data um, subject. Um, he also talks about just transferring your data to a foreign country, talks about penalties, um, exceptions to, you know, transfer to different countries. It's, it's, it's quite um, comprehensive, but not so cumbersome to read. And for easy um, administration, easy understanding of it, also has a guideline. So the NDPR now has a guideline which then breaks down, you know, all these aspects I've talked about and how you can easily implement them from, you know, the institution or the, um, the assigning of a data protection officer to, you know, some of the technologies that guide how you actually collect data, to what is meant by consent, um, the use of data, declaring, you know, beforehand, this is what I'm going to use your data for, to like the number of days you're supposed to actually collect data, to how you're supposed to store and, you know, recycle and destroy data, you know, it, it, so the, the NDPR itself is 20 pages, but then it has a guideline that would give you even more information as to how to implement the NDPR. Um, so that's that's about the NDPR without going too much into it. I know there's another user that I supposed to another um, speaker that I supposed to talk about your rights specifically as a data um, data um, subject. So I won't go too much into that. But that's also an aspect of the NDPR. Another thing that um, another regulation that you probably need to be aware of apart from the NDPR and the NDPR guideline is then the Nigeria Data Protection Bill. The Nigeria Data Protection Bill um, is like uh, an instrument that um, was released last year for the institution or establishment of a data protection commission. So we have the NDPR, but we also know that we need like an institution that would be man that will be saddled solely with the responsibility of data privacy, right? Data protection. So that's what the bill is about. And to give a bit of context to you know, what that contains. Um, again, it just states some of the reasons for having a commission that is dedicated for this um, reason. But then it talks about also who the commissioner would be, some of the um, requirements for that, who the other members of the committee would be, um, how the council would be funded, um, roles and responsibilities of different people in that committee, um, how they will be audited on an annual basis. And it then goes into, you know, again, conditions of consent, data protection, impact assessment. Um, it, it, it then goes into talking about how data will be collected in terms of personal data, sensitive data, um, children data, you know, what constitutes a child's data, for example, what's from what age to what age, what are they supposed to be doing? Who are data protection officers? Who are data protection compliance officers? So basically, this commission is supposed to be the one that would then again be saddled with the responsibility of managing this whole thing. That's another bill you want to maybe get yourself um, familiar with. It's it's a good extent um, um, the authority for the data protection regulation, but it's just saying we need a particular commission or institution that would manage all of that. So it's the NDPR plus more. You want to get yourself familiar with that. Um, another one that people don't really know about is the child online child protection act, which then says now that you know people are on TikTok, people are on Instagram, people are, you know, children, children's data are collected for shopping purposes, for health, um, fitness, you know, you wear you wear Fitbits, your data is collected. You don't even know what data is collected, but you don't know where they go. Yeah. But basically yeah. it shows you that as a child from certain age to certain age, these are the data that should be collected. This is how to give consent. This is how yeah. to track. This is how to expunge your data or to ask that your data be expunged. You know, yeah. um, just it gives a big, big um, exposure to some things parents or guardians might not necessarily be um, um, focused on. So it just opens your mind and, and, and tells you about different things you should be aware of as parents and guardians of 
kids under certain ages. And finally, then is the Freedom of um, Information Act, which is an NCC Act, I believe. And it talks about how um, people say that um, um, government workers are very secretive. They don't tell them things. They don't know what's going on there. And as um, public servants that we are, you're supposed to be able to provide information. So the Freedom of Information Act basically talks about your rights as Nigerians to be able to work in CC media, for example, and demand for certain information. And that is compelled to be able to provide those information to, to you. Um, again, it's not it's not a bulky document. It shows you what the time frames are, what the penalties should be should an organization deny you. Um, you know, this information you're requesting for. Um, it talks about there will be cost to it, it talks about your rights. Again, it's data, it's your access to data, it's your rights as citizens of Nigeria to know things that are going on in government or about your data. And um, something people need to be aware of just for informational purposes, even if, you know, in my opinion. Um, again, I know that some of the other speakers are going to go even more in depth with some of the things. So I don't want to expand unnecessarily into other people's um, um, subject areas or focus areas. So I guess I will stop here. But I will just say that data is important and you as data subjects need to know your rights. So maybe pay more attention to the person that is coming after me now just to know your exact rights. But in terms of just document or regulations by government to ensure the you know, um, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and security or security of your data. These are some of the regulations or acts or bills that you want to be aware of. They are not bulky documents. I mean, I don't like to read things like that at all, but so I can tell you for free. They are not bulky documents, but think they are things that you should, as Nigerians, as citizens of Nigerians, be aware of. And um, again, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here today. I hope this has been somewhat informative to you. If you have any questions, I'm here. Please let me know. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. So, 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 Fatima, if there's anything I'm taking away from your short session now, is the fact that we need to have an entire session, you know, so another session, just you alone, maybe an hour, sharing more insights into, you know, what we, our responsibility to follow the bills put out by NETA or the NDPB, for us to understand what are our rights, especially for the children. So also the parts on the children that you talked about, you know, hit me well because um, we don't have a choice. Our children, you know, the, the younger ones are getting educated and informed through digital platforms. And, you know, it's our responsibility to have this information so we can manage either configuration of the platforms that they have access to or, you know, or managing, you know, what they're exposed to. So as part of the privacy week, we went to a school yesterday and, you know, they were young and the content was, you know, adjusted or tweaked to their understanding. And, you know, we just felt in it that we don't even actually need to wait for the privacy week. There has to be continuous education, informing teachers, parents, guidance on, you know, the rights of the child, the, the data for the child. So, so thank you for your insight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, just to buttress on, you know, the Child Rights Act um, online is also the fact that some people, so for example, whenever you have your child, you put your child's picture online and mm -hmm. some um, um, DAFA's organization feels like, oh, such a beautiful picture without mm. getting your consent, mm. without informing you, they go ahead and tap that, oh, such a fine picture, and they start to use it to advertise their products, you know, that is against the child's rights, and that is against your rights as a data subject, so those are some mm. of the things that, you know, are involved in that, so in terms of arbitration, in terms of dispute mm. resolution, in terms of just the rights of the child and how to manage all of that, those are some of the things you want to be aware of. And those are some of the things that are covered in the regulation that us as Nigerians and citizens of the country should be aware of. Okay, so so all of a sudden something is coming to my mind. And I'm like, one of the cons of all this child rights act to be a point where my daughter will tell me I can't post her on my WhatsApp status until I take her permission. Are we going to get to that point? I'm sure it's going to get to that point. So, <laughs> but yeah. but we'll, we'll you, have your, that you have your right mm -hmm. as a parent. Don't worry. You have your right <laughs> to an extent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think we're, so we're moving to our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Fatima. They, I'm, I'm sure there'll be questions. 
So we hope you stay around for a bit to be able to respond to them. So we're moving on to George, our next speaker, George Ayo. So George is a GRC expert, data privacy expert, helps organizations comply to standards. And he's going to be speaking to your right as a data subject, your right as a data subject. So George, take us away, please. All right, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Fatima. Um, for sharing very clearly uh, with us on the different laws and acts and regulations that guide data protection in Nigeria. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity um, to be sharing. I'm really excited uh, to be sharing on this particular uh, topic and mostly because we also have our regulators here. So, um, <laughs> and they can also guide us, you know, so we are responsible for making sure that the organizations that you deal with uh, take your data very seriously and they put um, structures in place, people structures, technology structures, and even process structures that help um, ensure that you do not suffer um, a data breach. Um, I was told by, the, uh, by our hosts, uh, that I have very little time, so I'm just going to run through my slides. I'm grateful that um, um, Fatima has shared extensively on some of the laws, so I won't go in depth on that. Um, I want to show my screen. Are you able to share your slides? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Just started sharing. Please, can you just confirm if you can see my screen? So I can start from the very first slide. Yes, we have your screen now. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so welcome. Uh, let's get this out. All right. Okay, so I'm speaking to you, uh, like you mentioned a moment ago, your rights uh, as a data subject. Okay, and um, you know, uh, like, like Fatima mentioned, uh, there are a number of reasons why uh, regulations like the Nigeria Data Protection Regulation. Uh, stood forward and events like this uh, the Facebook uh, Cambridge analytical uh, scandal that took place in sometime in 2018 is one very uh, major event that um, led to the establishment of regulations like the global uh, the EU GDPR regulation that uh, Fatima spoke about. In Nigeria, we have also had, interestingly, uh, quite a number of um, legal issues that have um, arisen as a result of uh, improper use of data or um, uh, as a matter of fact uh, our very regulator NIDA um, one time conducted an investigation on the very popular application that many people use through color as to the extent of data which they were collecting and whether or not um, um, they even needed the kind of information they were collecting you know as at the time when this happened in 2019 uh, it was observed that the application was collecting uh, information around your IP address, your device ID, SIM usage, um, the applica other applications you have installed on the phone, screen resolution, your device address book, um, browser details, and a whole lot more information that the regulators thought, oh, this, this information you are collecting, you, you don't need this much information um, to process or to carry out the business you're doing. You know, so there were a lot of issues. Very popular also was the, a case between some uh, barista, Godfrey, Enei, and MTN Nigeria. You know, so all of these led to um, the establishment of, of laws, uh, uh, of regulations like the NDPR. Uh, so she's, she's been through the main objectives of the NDPR, so I wouldn't be boring you with that for now. But I also like uh, you to know that your, um, your right to data privacy is also enshrined in the Nigerian constitution. So other than the, the NDPR regulation, there, there are other acts and uh, other uh, regulations that guide um, data protection and ensure that um, certain actors or individuals who have access to your data are not uh, taking on due advantage or using this uh, data for, um, uh, for, for purposes that are not uh, meant to be. Um, and like in, 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 in and like you already know, um, it's very common now for you to download a new application or visit a website and you have a privacy notice, something like this. You know, this is the, uh, the Leica notes where this company is saying, we don't really know what data 
about you in half or what we are doing with it. But when we figured it out, we let you know. Um, this is the very brief summary of what typical uh, uh, privacy policies you would see on a website. You know, so they're explaining to you um, what data they have about you, what data they're collecting, um, what they're doing with it, and how they're using it. Typically, they should also include uh, uh, ways for you to be able to modify that. Uh, so we'll get into that as we move along. But it's it's worthy of note that um, you don't want to be exchanging information when you don't uh, know uh, why or you don't know why this, this organization is using your data. So I'm going to take you through about eight um, uh, rights uh, that are ensured uh, uh, in, in the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation and also um, relevant to the EU GDPR and other data protection regulations. But because we are uh, we're speaking mostly to Nigerians and please let us know if you're joining us from other countries so we can we can uh, address you uh, properly. Um, but for speaking specifically to the NDPR, I'll be taking you about talking to you about your right to be informed, the right of access, the right to rectification, the right to object processing, the right to restrict processing, uh, your right to uh, data portability, and the right to be forgotten, and the, your rights in relation to automated decision making and profiling. Okay, so let's start out. What is personal data? Okay, um, so the very basics, like Fatima mentioned a moment ago, she mentioned this uh, uh, briefly, but this speaks to any information related to, to you, uh, the data subject, um, that, uh, that makes that as an, as an identifiable natural person, okay, either directly or indirectly. All right, this can be anything from your name to an address, a photo, email address, bank details, your posts and your information, pretty much all of that information you put out there on social media, or networking sites, or even on sites that you register either for one service or the other. All of this uh, constitutes to your personal data. And there are two types, it's broadly categorized to your general uh, personal data and sensitive personal data. Okay, so these are the category of information that fall under um, your, your, your general personal data. And of course, these other information are uh, the ones that are for now your sensitive personal um, data, your biometric data, information about your genetic information, okay? Uh, uh, information about your political opinion, religious beliefs, and all of that. All of that are considered sensitive information. Please, can I get a check if you can still hear me clearly? Can you hear yes, me? we can. Okay, great. I all can. Right, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. All right, so, and like I mentioned moments ago, um, um, you are, you are the data subject. Okay, so if, if you're asked who's the data subject, as far when when speaking to the rights of data subject, you are the data subject. Okay, and considering the scope of NDPR and scope of the regul uh, the scope of the regulation, every Nigerian uh, is a data subject, and anyone uh, 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 dealing with your information, either personal or sensitive, one ought to uh, take these things very seriously. Why, why should you be concerned about your rights? Well, you should be concerned about your rights because um, there is a lot of data mining going out there. As a matter of fact, the business that people try, like uh, what I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, webinar, data is gold. And the persons who can successfully exploit this data, either positively or negatively, can yield some sort of benefits or can carry out certain actions that can have, to take, have very, um, uh, damaging effects, you know, and can also have some really pretty good um, 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 effect on them. So you should know your rights um, because some persons will seek to abuse these rights and some persons will seek to uh, manipulate your data uh, as they should. So the very first one, your right to withdraw consent, okay? Um, for every time you provide your information, either you provide your information to a website or to an application or to um, a the event of someone offering you a particular product or service, you have a right to withdraw consent. You have a right to withdraw um, uh, uh, consent. Now, where, where the, the consent involves someone under 18 years of uh, 16 years of age, um, the, the, the consent must be authorized by a parent or a guardian. Okay, so this is where Fatima uh, was speaking to you uh, earlier when you spoke about your child. As a parent, you have a child, you have a, you have a right uh, to. Um, to give consent really to the use of your data. 
So they told her parents it's a big issue. So, so she can't <laughs> deny me. She can't deny me. <laughs> At this point, no, until she's over over 16, then she, she can yeah, give me half yeah. time sign a document to that. Okay, so yes, you have a right to withdraw all of content. The second right is that you have uh, an aligned rights, you have a right of access. Okay, so you have a right to ask, what data do you process um, about me? You know, uh, in the case I gave you a moment ago, um, several users, over 87 million um, users on that particular social network um, uh, had their information used for political campaigns and a lot of uh, activities without their concept. Okay, so you have a right to act. You have a right of access to your data. You have a right to know what exactly uh, are you processing about me. Okay, uh, so you have you have that access, and that should be uh, should be included in the privacy notice that you could see on the application website or tool or solution it is that you are you are using. Okay, you have a right to be informed. Okay, like I, like I mentioned moments ago, you have a right to be informed about what information is being collected, um, who is collecting, how long it will be kept, how can you file a complaint. So. Say, for instance, like the instance that uh, Fatima gave moments ago about her friend giving her phone number to shopping uh, uh, or to, to, to that agency or that, that particular institution. Um, um, they have a right, she has a right to know how her information is being used, right? And she has a right to, to know uh, uh, how she can file a complaint. So there's an issue now, how can I, how can I speak to you about this data that you have? Sometimes... Uh, we'll get we'll get to that. Okay, so uh, for things to look out for um, on that uh, on the information that you put out there, which is typically the privacy notice or privacy policy, like you may see it on some um, platforms, you should have a contact details to the data controller. And data controller, um, the context of all of this is the organization that's collecting your data. Um, the purpose for the data processing, legal basis for personal data processing, third party details, data retention period, and I uh, already mentioned that. Okay. Um, and you have a right to data rectification. So sometimes the, your data has been collected for one reason or the other, and they don't have it um, uh, correctly. Uh, they don't have your date of birth right, they don't have your name spelled right. You have a right to, um, to rectify such information. Okay. Because sometimes an um, institution making use of or having uh, your data may have a uh, ripple effect across uh, uh, many other institutions or many other engagements you may have because of your day-to-day your -day activity. So you have a right to, to rectification and you have a right to erasure. So I don't want you to have my information again. So you have collected my name, you have my phone number, you have my ad contact address. You have a right to be forgotten. This is also known as the right to be forgotten. Okay, so at every given time, if you see a, a number of times for some subscriptions that you have, um, when they send you emails or they send you uh, correspondence to your mailbox or, or most typically to your mailbox or some other way, they would usually, um, they would usually give you an option to either unsubscribe or, uh, or the option to code your data with them. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have a right to be forgotten and this shouldn't be taken away uh, from you. Okay. All right, and to the very sixth one, uh, you have a right to restrict processing. Okay, so uh, as, an, as an individual, you have a right to request that the organization uh, limits the way it uses your personal data. Okay, and where restriction in place, the data can be stored by that organization, um, except especially maybe for some legal reason or for some regulatory reason. But some organizations by law are required to keep um, your data for certain type of data for a specific uh, period. For instance, the banks. The banks are required to keep transaction data for the regulator uh, for banking institutions and many financial institutions have the responsibility to keep certain transaction records for a uh, considerable uh, period uh, before which we can purchase. this. However, you have a right to strict processing of your uh, data. Now, the, the very, the seventh point is that you have a right to data possibility, okay? So you, as a data subject, you have a right to request that your personal data be transferred directly from your system, from, from their system to those of another service provider or uh, be provided in structured, commonly used uh, uh, formats, okay? Um, a very common uh, example of how this is usually utilized by most persons is when you request that say, for instance, your transcript, university transcripts, 
uh, transferred from one university or from one school to another, either for the sake of pursuing the, the higher degree or for conducting some other activities within that school. So that's very a very uh, good example for when uh, this particular uh, or this particular right applies. So you have a right to data portability, and the very um, and you have. Um, the right uh, in relation to, to uh, automated decision making and profile. Okay, so at different points for different reasons, when uh, when your information is being processed, um, uh, your information may be transferred from one uh, from one particular entity or from one machine to another. You know, and these days we live. Uh, world where certain sort of background information is needed for other decisions. Very good uh, uh, example would be uh, someone, some organization processing you to give you a loan or to allow you access into a particular platform, all right? And they are making a decision to verify your information with another organization and before they, they conduct um, that particular exercise. You have a right um, to, to be aware um, of such profiling, you have a right to be aware of such uh, 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 decision being made using your uh, personal data. And the very last one that I have on my list is that you have a right to object. Okay, so at different points, when such decisions are being made about your data or are being, are being made about your, your information, um, you have a right to object. Okay, you have a right to object to the processing of that um, of your data. Uh, for a number of legal just uh, following the number of legal justifications. First, uh, say for instance, there's a task that's to be conducted uh, uh, with regards uh, rather a, a, for the good of public interest, you know, and um, some uh, authorities has been vested to the controller, okay? Now, sometimes it can also be for the legitimate interest of the, the controller and where um, your personal data is being used for direct marketing, you have a right to object, okay? Um, I'll go. Before we come to this, I, I want to speak specifically to one of the, the, the case, case laws that um, uh, I read about and uh, it was in the news at the time where a particular um, barrister, different from the, 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 the other one I mentioned, the first one was Godfrey Nyanye, had sued another entity in Nigeria, um, really for the use of his data without his, uh, with, without his consent and for marketing purposes. So he received all of these unsolicited, he had received all of these unsolicited messages and he had been signed up to a number of things that he didn't think uh, he, he, he had not subscribed to, you know, and he had, Filed a, a, he had filed a, a case court and sued this particular organization. And in both cases, both cases with the first organization and the second organization listed here, um, the, the, the claimants were awarded about five million naira in, in claims. So you have a right to object. So in summary, uh, we'll just go over it again. Okay, so you have a right in relation uh, to, you have a right to be informed, you have a right to access, the right to correction, the right to deletion, the right to temporary suspension of processing, the right to object, the right to data portability, and the right related to automated decision making and profiling. Okay, so uh, in summary, uh, I'd like to say that you have the right to protect your data. You know, uh, now this is speaking to the information that is in your hands. So you have your your ID card, your driver's license, your voter's card. Something I, I, I said I was going to point out is during this presentation. If you notice, uh, because we're in election season, there are a number of Nigerians that have been flaunting their PVCs, you know, flaunting their, say, oh, I have gotten my PVC, I can now vote. And while some are smart enough to cover the uh, their personal details, others just leave it open, you know? Um, you as an individual, while the organization uh, like uh, that's responsible for that uh, processing that information. And it may be doing all you can to protect your information and make sure it's not in the public domain. I mean, if you try to query annex database right now, you will, you won't find it because it's not accessible to you. That information is controlled information. They more, but they've given it to you now. They've issued it to you as a card. 
you shouldn't stand in front of the camera and just put out all that information out there. Um, persons with malicious uh, intent can exploit those information, and you don't know how far such data can be used um, against you in the future. So you have a right to know, first off, what are those laws um, that govern the public use of the data. It starts with you. It very well starts with you um, as an individual, okay? So what you look out for, what information do they have, what are they doing with it, who has access to your data, how can you rectify um, your data, all right? So while organizations are having uh, contracts and signing uh, agreements to make sure that they, they cater for data protection as they process your information or as they do business with one another, you have a right to, uh, to know what laws guide the protection of your data. Thank you all very much for your time. I hope I didn't spend more than the time I was spending or time I lost. Can you stay here? Okay. So, George, by the by the powers bestowed upon me, I would say yes, you used your time effectively and you didn't exceed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. So but, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Quite insightful. You know, I think the beauty of your session was what you did was you literally pulled from Fatima's session and you give you know more insight like a deep dive. In fact, it's, it feels like I'm some some sort of orchestration. Fatima knew you were going to break down and go deep down into some engagements. You know, she had um, shared you know, as into some points she had shared earlier. So thank you for your session. I'm sure we'll get some questions, you know, as we go. So we're going to move to the next speaker quickly. Um, Adenike, you know, from Velex, and um, our topic is on the policies that govern data collection in the gaming sector. You know, so, see, till we started doing some work or having some engagements with the players in the gaming sector, you would assume, oh, it's just a Wabai Jebu or Naira Bet, you would be surprised the number, as in the volumes they get from a number of people that engage the different platforms, and, then, and if you look at it from a national point of view, the citizenry, they enjoy gaming, they want to, you know, um, they enjoy the fact that they don't have to go to the roadside or the junction to be able to play the games and they could use the digital platforms. And there are a lot of them now. And trust me, even the formal sectors, you would assume it's an informal sector, you know, service, but you see, you'd be surprised at the amount of people in the formal sector that engage in gaming, you know, and, you know, which is quite, you know, comfortable for them through the platform. But what's key is how, what policies do they comply to? What, you know, processes do they have in place to secure the customer? So I'm sure Adenike will be giving us some insights into, you know, the governance of data collection in the gaming sector. So Adenike, please take us away. Thank you, Bolaboa Walewa, for the introduction. It's quite um, an insightful, um, events today. Thank you everyone for joining. We're hoping that at the end of the webinar, we would have been able to provide you with insights into your rights as a data subject, as well as the policies that govern data collection. We would also like to appreciate InfoPride for setting up this webinar to sensitize and generate awareness on the rights of data subjects. So I'll be sharing my screen with everyone. Let's just run quickly through the policies that govern data collection in the gaming sector. Um, introduction. So the gaming industry in Nigeria continues to thrive with the advancement of technology due to the large population in Nigeria, increased internet penetration, as well as the availability of smart mobile phones. So the advancement of technology has also increased um, the presence of various other industries, not only gaming. So you see the likes of the financial institutions, fintechs, and um, health institutions as well growing due to the advancement of technology. Um, and um, with the advancement of technology also lies KYC principles that entails that data subject provides data controller with personal details which identifies the customer. So when you as a data subject intends to um, register with a gaming company, you're required to provide some information like your name, your first and last name, your phone number, your email address, as well as your date of birth, because only adults above the age of 18 are allowed to play betting or gaming. And then 
Another principle that lies with KYC is um, the anti-money laundering and combating financing terrorism provisions that entails that businesses must um, conduct due diligence measures to identify their customers. So if you look at the present Money Laundering Prevention and Prohibition Act of 2022, it stipulates that gaming operators, financial institutions, as well as designated non-financial institutions that, and businesses must conduct KYC and um, due diligence before they establish business relations with a third party, so which entails you providing your personal data to those organizations. Now, drafting your policy. When drafting your policy, you have to understand that the data controller is the focal point in the data protection value chain. Now, who is a data controller? A data controller is the person that determines the how and the why your data is collected. So the how is here is determining how the data is processed. Why the why is determining the purposes for which your data is collected. While a data processor is the person that processes the data based on the instructions of the data controller. So let's put this in perspective using the gaming industry. Um, let's use the fictitious sport betting company, ABC Bets. My name is Adenike. I'm Adenike. I want to register to bet on ABC Bets. I'm required to provide my name, my surname, my email address, and some other personal details. When I provide it, I am the data subject. And ABC Bet, in this instance, is the data controller. While the data processor is a third party that ABC Bet is giving my data to, to um, process, for example, KYC verification, um, where you are required to authenticate the accuracy of the identification that I've provided as a data subject. So when drafting your policies, you need to understand that you need to identify the nature of data you collect. Um, the earlier speakers have spoken extensively on sensitive and non-sensitive data. The purpose of data collection, who are your data subjects? In so many instances, you find that most organizations believe that data subjects is only limited to your customers. No. Data subject also extends to your employees. So you as an employee should understand that the right that um, the earlier spoke on, you also have a right to consent. You also have a right to withdraw your data as an employee. Even we ourselves, when you go to an organization and you visit them, they give you a logbook and tell you to enter your details, fill in your name, your phone number. You are data subject in that respect. Even when you attend seminars, conferences, they give you um, logbook or um, attendance sheets to fill. In that instance, you are a data subject and you are entitled to your privacy policy and you're entitled to know the purpose for which your data is collected. Who has access to the data, duration of data storage, and who your data protection officer is. Now, the first policy that um, you need to understand when interfacing with gaming operators as well as other um, institutions is the privacy policy. Um, George has spoken on section 37 of the constitution, which guarantees citizens the right to privacy. And as well, Article 2.5 of the NDPR has specifically stated that where personal data is required to be processed or obtained, it must display a privacy policy or notice that is simple, that is visible and easy to understand such that you, the data subject, reading through will be able to understand what the policy is stating and as well article 2.5 goes ahead to provide specifications that should be included in your privacy policy like a description of what constitutes a data subject consent so most often than not when you go online when you try to register with this website you just see click i click um, i accept to the terms of use and privacy policy before proceeding and I know that majority of data subjects just flip through the privacy policy without necessarily checking if it contains what um, the, the law has stated should be contained in the privacy policy, such as the description of the collectible information and purpose of collection. So you should be describing that, oh, we collect your name, your phone number, your details, maybe due to KYC um, measures, or we collect it for lawful purposes to identify you as a customer distinct from the next customer. Now your privacy policy should contain the technical methods used to 
collect and store personal information. In this regard, we're referring to security of the data that you're collecting. Access, if any, to third parties, that's data processors, a highlight of the principles of processing. Are you, are you processing it lawfully? And lawful processing has been highlighted in Article 2.2 to state that are you getting the consent of the data subject before processing the data? Or are you processing the data in relation to a contract that ought to be performed in which the data subject is a party to? Or is it in relation to public interest? Article 2.2 has highlighted about six instances of lawful processing. And then a privacy policy should contain available remedies in the event of violation. Now, there are instances where you have data breach. In fact, in Nigeria, we have frequent issues relating to data breach. The question is, does the privacy policy contain remedies that are available to me as a data subject? So where there are data breaches or leakages, I know that I have a right to be compensated. And the time frame for remedy, you don't, you don't tell me two years I should come back for compensation. You should have a time frame for compensating a customer that, um, where you've leaked the data to a third party, as well as the right of data subjects that George has spoken extensively on. Now, data protection policy. A data protection policy is a statement that sets out how the organization protects personal data. Now, there's a misconception between a privacy policy and a data protection policy. A privacy policy is usually like a privacy notice that is displayed on your website or read to the data subjects, letting them understand the purpose of collection of data and the type of data you collect and their rights. What a data protection policy is more or less like an internal policy that you have in place um, for your employees and drawing out the structure or processes that you have in place to ensure data protection. So um, the law does not specify, the regulation does not specify um, suggestions that should be contained in your data protection policy like the privacy policy, but we have highlighted some suggestions that should be contained in a data protection policy, like the organization's general approach to processing, lawfulness of processing, as well the details of the data controller and protection officer must be contained in your privacy policy. So um, every organization that, that actually collects personal data of Nigerians, both home and abroad, should have a data protection officer in the organization that ensures compliance with the regulations. So details of the data protection officer should be stated in the privacy policy such that the data subjects will have access to be able to communicate with the data protection officer. An international transfer of personal data, if any. As a data subject, you need to understand that your data should not be transferred to another jurisdiction, first, without your express consent, and two, without necessarily the consent of the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation. How data processing practices are reviewed, technical measures, training of staff, and other suggestions. Now, another policy that most organizations usually um, do not avert their minds to is the records retention and erasure policy. Now, most people would have the privacy policy and the data protection policy, but they do not have a record retention policy. Article 2.1, subsection 1c of the NDPR has stated that data controllers are required to store data only for the period they are reasonably required to do so. Now, what level of um, record storage are you expected to have? The law does not specify the period in which you are required to store data. But in certain scenarios, existing laws and contractual agreements will actually specify the duration for storing your data. So, for example, the Money Laundry Prevention and Prohibition Act of 2022 in Section 5 has stated that gaming operators, including online operators, must store record for a duration of five years from the date of the last record. And if you look at the Implementation Framework 2020 of the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation, it also states that um, where there is no specified duration, you should store data for three years, and where data subjects comes to you directly to enforce their rights to withdraw consent, you should immediately erase the data you have collected. So as much as you are having a retention policy, you should also have an erasure policy to state that when you want your consent to be withdrawn, 
we, we either use AI to destroy the data or if it's physical documents, we shred it with shredding machine and then the, the papers are bombed. Just have a policy in place to ensure that the data you are collected, you are, you are erasing it effectively. Information security policy. The next policy we'll be construing is the um, information sec security policy under Article 2.6 of the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation. Sorry, I've been going on and on. Please, is everybody following me? No, we are here. We are with you. I'm actually feeling you as you are breaking it down. So please. Okay, thank you very much. Then the information security policy under Article 2.6 of NDPR, it has stated that data controllers and processors must ensure that the data that they are collecting from you as a data subject must ensure that it is secure and must have in place security measures to ensure that third party does not have unauthorized access to the data that you are collecting. So we have highlighted some basically broken down what should be contained your information security policy. You can either encompass it into one policy or you can have separate policies that outlines acceptable use policy, which is um, acceptable use for your employees and um, usually an internal policy. Access control policy, anti-malware policy, like viruses, PAM, um, cloud computing policy. Who are your cloud providers? Where do you see, who are your data storage providers? It's very, very important to ensure that they also comply with the requirements of NDPR. It's important for you to ensure they have due diligence, you conduct due diligence to make sure that they are not transferring the data you are storing to a third party without your consent or information. Cryptographic policy, HR security policy, that's HR policies for employees to ensure that the employees that have access to the data understand the importance of securing the data importantly. Because there are instances where you see employees because they are groused or aggrieved or because they are looking for more money. We understand how the Nigeria economy is. You just release data of your organization to a sister company or to um, an opposing company just because you want to get more money. So. As I am in the gaming industry, I've had new companies, including existing companies, approach me to say, oh, please, um, can you provide us with data of um, Nigerian customers? So I want to onboard new customers. I need phone numbers. I need email address. I'm like, I don't have this data. And they tell you, don't worry, no matter the amount, I'll pay you in millions. But you need to understand the importance of ensuring security of data. That is why you need to have in place controls to ensure that those who have access to the data do not disclose it to a third party. Mobile device policy. What devices are you using in your organization? If you have official devices, that's office phones, you should ensure you don't mix it with personal, personal issues. Office phones are used for official communications. Then as well, physical security policy, CCTV. Now in Nigeria, when you go to a supermarket, you see CCTV, they should actually have a notice that states that this organization or this business is under CCTV surveillance 24 seven. Because even my image rights, I also have image rights as well. So I come into your supermarket, you are recording me. I need to understand that you are going to record me while I am in your supermarket or store, whichever the case or organize organization. Then email policy, electronic messaging policies like email policy to so state that emails that you'll be sending with the official email are only sent to um, official, other official emails. So you're not using official emails for personal use. You're not sending office emails to wrong email addresses such that a third party that does not need to know that um, whatever business you're in. Rather, let me give an example. So I'm sending a mail and then I miss two letters, or I send it to a wrong person. That person already has the content of that email and it might be confidential or classified information. So you need to ensure that your employees understand the importance of having email policy in place. We've also outlined some internal documents as an organization that you should have in place to ease your implementation of um, NDPR and as well to ease data protection, like data retention schedule, so that you understand that within this duration to this duration, I should study data. Then from the third year, I should um, shred or erase the data. Data subjects consent form, like health institutions that deal with um, sensitive data, they should have in place data subjects consent form because they require higher consent compared to organizations that deal with non-sensitive personal data. Um, we also outline procedures, notification and templates for data subject rights requests, 
third party processing agreement um, under the NDPR, when you are entering an agreement with a third party processor, you should ensure that that processor complies with the provisions of NDPR and also has in place security measures to protect the information that you are giving them and should ensure they keep confidentiality information. Cookies policy. Cookies are usually used to analyze traffic and to ease user experience on platforms. So when you go online, you usually see um, click to accept this cookie. Those companies that use cookies should have cookie policy in place to explain to you why they are using cookies, what they use the cookies for, and then um, your rights as well as data subjects. So drafting the right policies, what do you need to draft the right policies? Who do you need drafting the right policies? You need your legal team, your data protection officer, your HR team in regards to your employees, as well as executive that will approve the policies that you have drafted. We as Velex Advisory, how can we assist you? We can assist data controllers and processors with preparation of policies, review of new and existing policies, third party processing agreements, engagement regulators, and GPCOs like InfoPrive, as well as data breach resolution. So where you are a data subject and you suspect data breach, you can reach out to us to help with resolving data breaches and leakages. So in conclusion, it's important to not just have the right policies in place, but to ensure that you have data protection processes and measures that are implemented to prevent data breach and sanctions from the regulators. So it is one thing to have the policies. I realize in Nigeria, there's so many theory and in practice, we have little to nothing. So it's one thing to have the policies. It is one thing to ensure that you are, is another thing to ensure that the policies are processed and implemented in line with what you have written. Now, in, in recently, um, NDPB, that's the Nigerian Data Protection Bureau, has um, commenced an investigation into data breach allegations against Denit Bank and Guarantee Trust Bank because, you know, they, sus they, they, they suspect that there are data breach and leakages. So we have instances in the industry where customers are saying, oh, money is disappearing from my account. I don't know what is going on. I don't know what is happening. It's data breach. So that's why you have to ensure that you have not just the policies, but you have measures to implement the policies in your organization. And benefits of implementation increases trust and credibility from your customer. It promotes easier business process automation. You have improved data management. It promotes security of the platform itself, protects um, enhanced enterprise and capacity building for your staff and employees. Um, thank you. If you have any question and answer, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Um, all right, thank you very much. You know, so, you know, you'll be surprised then as a host or moderator of a lot of sessions, you would assume I'm sitting in a position where I know enough, but, you know, one important thing with the sessions today is I'm literally paying attention throughout and, and I'm picking up a lot of insights and education. So well done, nicely done, Adinike. Good. The good thing is we are moving to the next section, which is, you know, interim questions, we're taking questions now before we move on to the next speaker. And a question popped up just before you finished. So Adenike, please be on standby. And the question goes from Kinsley Duru. Kinsley is asking, what is the difference between data protection and data privacy? What is the difference between data protection and data privacy? So data protection usually entails the internal policies that you have in your data protection policy is the policies that you have internally to govern your organization and as well your employees management with um, data that comes across to them. But a privacy policy is usually displayed on your website or in your physical offices. Privacy policy and notice is usually given to um, your customers to explain the purpose, the, data, the kind of data you collect from them, the purpose of collecting that data and the use, um, necessary use of data, as well as your security measures, right of data subject. So it's more or less like gives more information about your protection of the privacy of the customers. That's where data privacy comes in place. While data protection is a much broader concept, but the policy itself is an internal policy. Thank you. All right, thank you, Adenike. Um, so there's another question from Emmanuel. So Emmanuel is asking, how do we address the issue of, or how do we protect against the issue of 
data being transferred between group of companies. You want me to state that again? Yes, please. Okay, so Manuel is asking, how do we address the issue of, or how do we protect against the issue of data being transferred between group of companies? So I'm talking, I'm you. speaking about confidentiality. How do you ensure confidential information does not go to the wrong person or the right information is passed between the different companies or entities or the right data is shared between different entities or a group of companies? So the question is, the first thing you need to understand is data transfer between companies. You cannot transfer data without the consent of the data subject. That's the first issue you need to understand. So even if you are sister companies, you are two different entities. So you need to understand, and then there are some instances where the sister company is an international company. What our advice is in your privacy policy, before you onboard that customer, you need to put it in there that um, this data that we're collecting from you will be shared with our sister company or our group headquarters company outside the jurisdiction, and then get their consent before you proceed, before you transfer the data to the third party. I don't know if this addresses your question. Absolutely, I'm sure it addresses it. And I have a very good example. Some days ago, um, some financial services company that we work with, which is a group, wanted to share our data with a sister company, like a subsidiary of the group. And they sent us an email. So it's a financial services and sister company is a pensions company. And they sent us an email, you know, asking for permissions to share our details with the pension arm of their group. Uh, for us to give them a consent before they shared and we responded, you know, before they could share that. So your, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, there's another, okay, yeah, I think it's a comment, but I think it comes with a question. So uh, Yusuf has put in the comment section, data privacy or data privacy already the data subject to request for further processing of user information. How do we address this when it comes from audiovisual recording of an event. So I think it's saying data privacy speaks to um, uh, already the data further processing of information. How do we, so I think it's, the main question is, how do you address when it comes from audiovisual recording of an event, like this event, I'm sure. He asks a second question. Secondly, government parastatals that request for more than the required information when applying for services. How are they affected by the requirements of data privacy? So the second question, I believe Fatima is in a better position since she is um, the regulator here. Exactly, my thoughts too, you know, but give, maybe you should give a, the first question a stab and then let's see if Fatima is available to respond. I think she's here, so, but... Hopefully, after you respond, and then we'll just check with her. So let me give example. Now here you are. We are recording this conversation. When you, when you, um, when you on board, or let me not use the word on board. Um, when you log in to Zoom, right, and a session is being recorded, you have a notice that says this um, session is recording. You understand they've already notified if you do not want your face or your audiovisual to show you have the option to exit or you don't want your details to be to be recorded you have the option to exit or you can request that you do not want your um your face to show you turn off your video but i'm not sure i understand the question i'm sorry i was on mute so i think the major focus on the question is how do you manage if, you know, data, okay, so it's a bit complex. So you're saying if the data is passed from audio visual, so let's hope Yusuf would re-ask the question, you know, for the first one, and then we'll come back to it. Fatima, are you available for the second question? So he's asking how, um, data, uh, secondly, uh, the government parastatals that require too much information when you're applying for services, um, how are they affected by the requirements of data privacy? Fatima, are you there? 
also we can get other speakers to answer george you know bamidele okay okay i think um let me just add um there's a comment from a east um talking about an additional option when people want to collect your data which has now been included in the responses and for you to be able to say you prefer not to provide that information or prefer not to, to say anything concerning your own information when they want to collect your data. And I think that is very apt and we need to take note of that so that we, even when we don't see it, we can also draw the option with people that want to collect our data as well. And then concerning the first question, when you go for events and then people end up taking your um your visuals without your consent. Again, I believe this is an awareness program as well, and it's also letting us know the rights that we have. So it's also for us to go from today to let people, such people know that before they actually get your data, they also need to seek your consent and they also need to ensure that whatever it's the purpose they're collecting your data for, they actually use it for the right thing as well. What that does is that you're creating awareness in the environment, you are, when you're in the society, and the people that do these things, they also now need to go back and ensure that they're actually following the law and it's not just an all-commerce affair. So it's a two-way thing. You're creating um, awareness in the environment, you're informing people in the society, and it creates a check and balance um, situation in the society. So before people go ahead to do things, they need to actually check themselves. So I'll round up with what she also mentioned about going into the supermarket and then the CCTV is just capturing you without even informing you before you do that. That also needs to be flagged out. So that such supermarkets also need to take notes. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Bamdele. So Yusuf came back with some more clarification and he mentioned, you know, some videos will be made available post event and also for some other uses. Does the initial consent cover this? Um, so I think I've, I've been part of events where they literally reach out to let you know that they would use your recording. And even pre the events, they go all out on actual usage, even on platforms They let you know that they would use for ads or promotional, you know, after the event. So I think, I think that covers. So we have more questions. Um, Donald Michael is asking, it's a bit lengthy, but I'll just run through it. Hi, Adenike, you said something pertaining to security behind cookies, knowing fully well that cookies only store personal information on the browser and cyber attacks can hijack cookies and enable access to one's browsing sessions. The question is, how do cookies violate privacy and what is the security measure needed to be put in place, you know, to ensure data on cookies are not exfiltrated? I would say this question shouldn't go to only Adenike, you know, um, but well, I think you, you can jump at it. Sure. George, too, you can jump at it. This. Yes. So, um, um, you know, I've been trying to keep up with, with some of the questions. Uh, <laughs> um, so they, they keep popping. So I, I, well, I want to start from the very first, the, one of the questions that was asked about data privacy and data pro protection, okay? So um, I posted moments ago that data privacy pretty much, like um, uh, I didn't care mention moments ago, um, defines who has access to data in very simple terms, who has access to data, while data protection provides the tools and policies to actually restrict access to that data. So I thought to just, um, to just point that out. Um, I also saw a question about, uh, Okay, so I'll leave Adenike to respond to the one um, pertaining cookies. However, I see the other question that says, how can a data subject enforce his right to be forgotten? Well, for starters, you can notify the organization through the channel that they've defined for um, to handle complaints related to data um, privacy. So most organizations have a channel um, that, they, um, that they've defined. So if you go through their policy, um, you'd see um, you'd see a contact email or a contact phone number. You can send an email, send a phone number, send uh, uh, put a message through to that details. I think emails are an effective way to do it. And there is the Nigerian uh, Data Privacy 
uh, the Nigerian uh, Nigerian Data Protection Bureau. Um, they are very well interested in getting. Um, they are they are very well on the on the uh, the case of organizations that uh, that seek to ignore or flout all of these rules and, and all of that. So the very good practice puts put this 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 organization in in, in in copy of your emails they have certain contact phone numbers and they have a website so you can get details from NIDA, you can get details from the ndpb put them in copy of your of your correspondence you'll be shocked at the speed at which those organizations will respond um, i have done it a couple of times where my data was being used in, in a way that I, I was not comfortable and i needed them to purge my data from their system you know so put them in copy of this email and of course, you'd, you'd get a response. Of course, the other, um, other steps you can take is to, to escalate legally um, by filing a, a complaint and all of that. So, but by even contacting these organizations, you would have um, escalated, uh, enforced your rights in a way. Um, what other question? Uh, I hope, I don't know if there's a, is that, did I skip anyone? So George, uh, there's the question of the cookies not yet responded to. Okay, so let me let me take that. Okay, so you said something pertaining to security behind cookies, knowing full well that cookies only store personal information on the browser and cyber attacks can hijack cookies and enable access to one's browsing sessions. The question is, how do cookies um, violate privacy and what is security measures needed to be put in place to ensure data on cookies are not exfiltrated? Okay, so um, as for data protection when it comes to, or rather as for, um, as per your, your question on the mass security measures that can be taken, um, there are a number of uh, 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 secure coding uh, practices that organizations should put in place. Um, if, you, um, if you, for an individual, when you ask for this measure, I'm thinking about it from different sites, from the angle of the team responsible for the application development, there are a number of checks and a number of uh, uh, practices they can put in place to make sure um, that, um, um, information that is captured via cookies are not uh, manipulated. That's the technical bit. As an individual, you can use um, a number of uh, uh, web um, application. Uh, you can use a firewall, okay? So if you have, if you use a browser, it's, it matters these days, there are a lot of browsers that people use for one reason or the other, either to bypass a certain security on the systems or on the network where they are on, but it's by also making sure that your antivirus you use an active antivirus and uh, a web filtering uh, application that helps you to filter up apps that are whose cookie setting or whose, whose cookies are not configured in a, in a secure uh, manner. So that's, those are some steps you can take uh, to ensure that your data is not unduly exaggerated. Okay, so I hope that responds to that. Um, there's a question in the, there's a All case- right, no, George, the so George, so, so oh, George. So George, what we'll do is let's move on to the next session with Bamidele. Yes, and yes, then and we can compile we'll continue to respond. So there's a question from Israel and the chat section is actually really, you know, bubbling right Buzzing. now with a lot yeah, of questions sure. and comments. So please let's continue to respond to the questions in the comment section, the chat section, and please keep asking your questions. We'll respond to every one of them. But we are moving to the next and our last speaker for today. Um, Bamidele Obende, and he would be speaking on tools that help automate data protection policies. This session is very important because, you know, we're getting to the point where, okay, we've heard about policies, processes required, you know, technologies required, the actions that need to be taken, wow. needs to be put in place. Like where Bamidele is coming from is Bamidele wow. giving us a platform, giving us a service right. that should help us, you know, meet this and achieve this. So Bamidele, please take us away, you know, thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Can everyone hear me please? Balabo, can you hear me? I can hear you properly. Mm. Okay, thanks for the introduction. And I'll just um, go through this as fast as possible and also share as much information to the house as well. So I uh, would we'll try to do this from another angle and try to say, look, so for example, everybody keeps talking about data privacy, data protection and all. And why do people don't, or rather organizations, don't try to ensure that they actually make sure their organization follow the rules, follow the act, follow the regulations and all. And one of the things we found out is because 
a lot of people think the process is cumbersome, it's old, and nobody wants to do the things manually anymore. Not. So we've tried to say, look, let's go in a different way, let's go in a different approach and ensure that as much as possible, we're able to make sure organizations can conform to the regulations, to the standards, and in doing that, they protect themselves and also protect their clients and customers as well, as the case may be. So we said a modern approach to data protection policies. And we're trying to do that using our platform, which is called Unomi. And Unomi is an automated cybersecurity compliance, security, and governance platform. And we also try to say, look, even if we don't want to do this thing, why are we going through this method in trying to ensure that people may comply or rather they follow the procedures? And we said, look, what is NIDA saying? What is the NDPB saying? What is the NDPR saying? And we said, look, this is what the law, rather the regulation says as of today. And why are they trying to do this? One of the things that Fatima has spoken about, also George and also um, Adenike as well, all has to do with regulation in ensuring that subject, data subjects who are people, that they are actually protected, their, their rights are not violated, people don't use their data for malicious activities. A typical case in point was something that I didn't care, or rather was if Fatima actually said, and she was talking about um, consent of children for their pictures or for their data to be exposed. I'm sorry to say this, you see a lot of schools, when it's time to do admission for a new session, they go ahead, they take the finest boy or the finest girl in class, and they go up there and just do the adverts with the child without taking consent for, of the parents. That Look, I'm going to use your child or your, your son or your daughter to do this advert for the school. And the parent is just moving along the road one day and he sees his child, one giant big boy there for the whole world to see. Nobody knows where that data gets to. Nobody knows who else is going to use that data. So it also calls upon every organization to ensure that, especially this, let me talk about this, because especially the schools, when you actually take this data of children, ensure that you follow the laws, ensure that you comply with the laws, and ensure that you even as you make use of the data, you use it in the appropriate format. So we talked about what NDPR says about processing um, personal data and making sure that the data being processed is conducted or intended to be conducted in respect of natural persons in Nigeria. Because the NDP uh, regulation talks about subjects in Nigeria. And then we now went further and said, look, so what exactly could be an issue? What exactly um, is the problem? Why do organizations as a whole not go ahead to actually follow this compliance and all those things? Or even before then, what are the things that organizations need to take care of in when, they, when they've run, in order to ensure they don't run foul of the regulations and all that? We said, look, for organizations to guard against legal and liability concerns, data security and business reputations, Organizations need to ensure that they undertake regulatory compliance all the time. They need to assess whatever they are doing as a business concern or as an organization and ensure that they comply with the regulations. Um, Adenike mentioned the, the story that came out about um, GT Bank and Zeni Bank this week that NDPB is taking a look at them based on some violations that have occurred. Even if they end up paying a fine, yes, if they are found guilty, there's something that also needs that we also need to take note of business reputation. Business reputation. There are a lot of stories all over social media these days. Telling you open up um, a social media app or whatever, you hear somebody lamenting. Somebody has gone into my account, somebody has hacked into my account. Even if you end up repaying the person the money back. The business reputation, how do you quantify the business reputation that has been what destroyed? How do you how do you ensure that you restore your reputation back to the way it was before that incident happened? One of the things that compliance will help us to do is to guard against our reputation being destroyed. We'll ensure our data we collect, they are also secured, and we'll also ensure that legal and lab, um, liability concerns are also properly taken care of. So we've tried with Unomi to ensure that 
for standard ad assessments like NDPR, PCI DSS, ISO, and some others that we're going to put them on the platform and to ensure that people will be able to use the platform using the assessment, using the processes to be able to achieve compliance. We've also seen another reason why organizations don't go ahead to do to ensure compliance in the organization is because the processes actually take time. And if your organization is so large, it's so vast, when you think of the time that it's going to take to actually carry out this assessment and all, some people just give up and say, look, I can't even go through this stress. And when they, some of them even end up trying to do it and they call in organizations to help them, they don't even go through the full hog because they keep saying the time is too long and all those things and all. But one of the things we've tried to do with UNOMI is that using UNOMI, if you want to carry out your compliance activities, we're going to reduce that time for you. We're going to ensure that time is reduced as much as possible. And again, um, we've carried out, research has shown over time, which we've also carried out with, as well, using um, our partner, InfoPrive on this course. Research has shown over time as well that based on um, the challenges that organizations actually face in not carrying out their compliance, what are those typical challenges that you see all the time that organizations end up not being able to achieve their regulatory standards? We've seen that they are unable to achieve um, regulatory standards because they cannot abide by the laws that have been set up by government. For example, taking um, NDPR, they are unable to actually achieve that because Adenike was going through um, so many documents or rather some documents. For example, some organizations will say, going through these documents, how do I even abide by them? How do I even ensure that I even understand what they are saying and all? With you know me, we've been able to put those laws, the assessments online and everything to ensure that as you actually go through the platform, because the platform is designed in the form of a workflow. As you read the questions, as we provide the templates for you to use, you understand it and you get to appreciate these government laws, most especially concerning data. You get to appreciate it for yourself as an individual, and you get to appreciate it even for your organization as well. So the platform will actually help you to abide by the laws once you follow the assessments and the questions that are there. Another thing is because so much documentation is required. Where do I start from? Where do I get this documentation? Using you know me as a platform, you have the chance to actually reduce the documentation that you have, especially physical documentation, because you have the documentation on the platform. If you, after completing your process, if you need to change something in the next three months, in the next six months, you, you just go back online, change it, and the person that you are working with, the organization you are working with as a DPCO, will go back on the platform and confirm again that you've actually done the required changes or rather you've updated the documents that are required. So for the situation of the problem of increased documentation, you know me actually helps in that as well. One of the challenges the organization also faces is because they don't have executive visibility. So your MD is sitting somewhere, is giving the go ahead to say, go ensure that we're NDPR compliant. The people carrying out the activity, they are unable to pass the information back to the MD, back to the directors that this is the stage that we're in, this is what we have done so far. But will you know me at a glance, your executives are able to know what percentage of compliance have you guys reached. If you say, for example, we've drawn out a project plan to say, look, we're going to carry out our NDPR compliance activities for the next six weeks, for the next four weeks. If the MD or the executive comes back in the next two weeks, you should be able to know that, look, we've done just 10% or we've done 50%. So, if, for example, if you've done 10%, he you knows you can't finish that activity in the next four weeks. So, it's a red flag for him. He has executive disability and is able to ensure that the team double up on their efforts and they're able to carry out the process and the procedures properly at the time. There's lack of alignment in the organization. The executive is giving out an order, the people to comply, the data protection officers to comply and all, or the DPC is working with them. Everybody not working in sync. But using you know me, there's alignment from the angle of the DPCO, 
from the data protection officer, from the executive, and you're able to drive it down the organization because at a glance, you actually know what is happening everywhere in time. And then I'll just also relate this with what happened during the week again. Like I said, you mentioned Zenit Bank and GT Bank that NDPB is actually um, doing a study, rather, is actually investigating to see what happened. And somebody made a comment in one of the groups that I'm in. Somebody made a comment and he said, the reason why such things happen is that, look, at the top, they don't know what is happening. So data gets out of the system. People have access to data that they shouldn't have access to. But one of the things that you normally will help you to do as well is that only the required people that, uh, that have access to the required data that they should have access to will have access to such data. And then lack of training. These days of Japa, 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 you employ somebody today, the person in the next six months has left the organization, then you have to start afresh again, getting the right person in. I even start training the person. For example, if the person has been there for the last three, four years, carrying out that room right, in the organization. With you know me, you're getting a new person, he already has a platform to start off afresh. That platform will help him to ensure that he comes up to speed quickly to know where the organization is, depending on the compliance status that they need to achieve. He's able to know what has been done in the past, in the past records. He knows how they've actually made relevant changes that should be done and how to move ahead. So it's not going to take time to say he's starting afresh or the organization says we're going to start training again. You know me solves that problem training for you. And it will, you also will be able to use it to actually spread such awareness around the organization as a whole. But getting consigned. People always talk about, ah, you will have the money to spend and all that. Using you know me, you will be able to also cut down on your cost as well. Inadequate IT support. Story of Japan again. Every day, everybody is leaving. Everybody is leaving. Which is good in a way, but over here, other people are also, so, are also suffering. But then using you know me as well, you'll be able to at least take care of a certain part of the business that you won't have so much issues of replacing staff and things that have to do with that. Um, Adenike, yes, Adenike, when she was giving a presentation, she made mention of people having mobile devices, capturing data or doing official work on personal mobile devices instead of um, official mobile devices. One of the things we've observed over time, rather that we know based on our research and findings as well, is that because people work in distributed teams, they are able to save data in several locations, which shouldn't be. Now, if you put in your processes in place in your organization, using you know me, and everybody knows what to do at each point in time, they know the repercussions of not doing the right thing at the right time and not using the right equipment or infrastructure for them to work properly as an, as an organization. They know that they, they are going to run into issues the organization also knows as, as well. You know that even if you're using distributed teams, things or data that have to do with people that work in the organization, they need to know where to store that data. They need to know where to also retrieve the data. They need to know where to make the changes that are required at an ONG so that the organization should, will know how to conform to the standards and the regulations that set by the regulator. In issues resolution inefficiency. If your data is all over, or rather if your assessment that you've done is stored somewhere else, ability to retrieve it is hard. You don't even know if there's, a, if, there's a, if there's an issue that has not been resolved and you keep carrying it over time. With you know me, you know the issues that have not been resolved. You know what time you're supposed to resolve the issue. If you know it's taking longer than the agreed time to, to, for the issue to be resolved, notifications, prompts are sent at you, and everybody gets back on their tools and they need to make sure that they go ahead to resolve the issue. One of the things you know me will do will show you at a glance, what are my outstanding issues? What are the issues that I know I need to fix as quickly as possible? How do I ensure I meet the deadline? You know me will help you to achieve that as well. Next slide. Okay, so our solution, which I've more or less described over time is you know me. And you know me is a cybersecurity compliance and governance automation platform that helps organizations ensure continuous compliance with regulatory standards. For this purpose, we're talking about NDPR, but again, we're able to do other regulatory standards, like I mentioned before. 
PCIDA says ISO and SOC and the others. It's an automated platform. What we've done is that it's a workflow. So you just walk through the workflow from beginning to next. You know, it's like doing next, 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 provide this evidence, next, 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 provide, fill up this template, save it. It's just next, next, next and all. Which brings me back to, there's this word, or rather there was this song some time ago, but I came across the word in 2001. And I think about five, six years ago, there was this song by one of the musicians in Nigeria talking about soft work and everything. And whenever I hear that song, I just laugh because of what the word means to me. Well, using you know me, it will help you to actually make your work easier. And then you soft work for more or less everybody. And then like we like to say in this part of the world, it gives you soft life. You give the soft life more or less using you know me. So um, we'll employ everybody to also just try. Come take a look at the soft life using you know me in trying to meet compliance. We have reviewed policies and controls that are mapped to the end NDPRO architecture. So you know what the NDPRO, um, this thing, architecture says, what are the questions you need to answer? What are the evidences you need to provide? How do you ensure that you meet those um, uh, requirements? How do you ensure the evidences are, you can provide the evidences? Using the platform, it helps you to do all that. If you don't have the evidences, if you don't know how to go about the evidences, we have examples, we have templates on the platform that will give you a guide. And then working with our DPCO as well, um, InfoPrive, the um, auditors are on ground to also handhold you using the platform to ensure that you are able to provide the evidence or uh, the evidences that you require. Our solution focuses on privacy impact assessment, automated compliance, um, health check statistics of your organization to know how what am I doing as of today? Am I really compliant? If I say I have all this information, there, my evidence is even enough to ensure that if there's an issue, that if NDP says they want to do an audit or a spot check on my business, where are my are today? Our, our, our um, solution, our platform will help you to do that. Compliance standard reminders as well. So for example, you may have finished your certification or your compliance as of today, you've been mapped, certified, everything is okay. When is the next one due? Do you have a date? to know that, ah, this is when the next one is due. Have you also set an alarm that, ah, in the next three months, I'm going to do an audit again on my internal processes to ensure that I confirm to what I've said my business will do. So using our platform, using Unomi, you'll be able to do such automatic reminders. The reminders will tell you when it's time to do this, when it's time to make it happen, and then you'll be able to go ahead to do it. Easy integration with third party services. We can do that via our platform as well because your um, service is on the cloud. If your service is on premise and if your service is at the DRO site, also we can do the integration and ensure that we're able to actually also see what you have in your environment and also work with you effectively. So I said, real time compliance tracking, team collaboration because. When you carry out audits, not only one person carry out audits, the team that is behind that audit. And I, I think I also try to share the different people that should take part in what in carrying out the audits in that organization. They should also be able to know that they are working together and they are working together as a team. Using you know me, you'll be able to do team collaboration effectively. We have the guidelines on controlled objectives already in the system. And the best part of it is the workflow that also ensures that CS is easy to use. Um, I think I need to round up. I guess I've gone, I've taken so much of our time. But in a nutshell, uh, this is a summary of what you know me can do for you. But most especially again, let me also add DPCOs, DPCOs. DPCOs can also make use of this platform to manage their clients effectively. So it's not only for organizations just coming on their own. If there are DPCOs that are also out there, you can come and get onto Unomi and also make use of Unomi effectively. Thank you very much. My team and I were open for questions that may arise as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Bamidele. You know, so. I don't know. I, I think so. Like I told them, Adinike, you know, Fatima, if there's anything we're taking away from this session is creating breakout sessions where we 
focus on some of you know what you guys have talked about today. Um, definitely, from the things you talked about, we definitely need more, more time to be able to you know break it down and um, let people know the kind of value it brings to their organization. Okay, so time has been spent. We thank everyone that stayed with us till now. You know, it's really appreciated. You know, so I'm tracking participants, and we've been just the same number, which you know shows that you know the you know the session has been insightful. And we thank you for staying with us till this time. So as we round up, we just want to thank you for joining us. Um, we've put some information in the chat and comment section if you want to reach out to any of the organizations that were here today. If it's Adinik at Velex, Bamidele at Unami. George at InfoPrive, and then um, we want to reach out to the regulator, Fatima. You probably want to reach out to us to let us know what you want to reach out to us, and then we'll let her know about this. But we thank you for joining this session. Um, we'll then um, let you know about our next future sessions, and we look forward to having you around. If you have further questions, we would respond to these questions in the comment section, or you can send the questions to the emails that have been provided. So Adenike's email has been provided, George's email has been provided. Uh, I'm sure Bamidele's email will be dropped too. So please, you can send them emails, you know, and then they would respond immediately. So thank you everybody for joining. As we close out, we look forward to having you on our sessions, the next few sessions that will be coming up. Thank you and have, an amazing day. Thank you, Sue Thank, Thank you very much, Orlando. Uh, Thank you. As you go off, as you go off, we'll still take questions. So yeah, if you if you don't mind, but we are here pending when everybody leaves. Mm -hmm.